What is up guys? Welcome back to another GeekoWatt video. In this one, I'm going to be showing you how to put together an awesome $1,500 gaming PC build for playing the latest titles in 2023 and beyond. I'll be running you through the awesome parts that make this build possible and some good alternatives too, how to put the system together and looking at performance at the very end to make sure this system really stacks up well against the competition. Let's do this. As with any good gaming PC build, I'm going to start by installing as many components into this over here, the motherboard, as possible. Now that is going to include the CPU, RAM, and the SSD. The motherboard though, specifically I've gone for, is this, the Asus ROG ROG Strix B760A Gaming Wi-Fi D4. Basically, it's a B760 motherboard with a white color scheme to match the case in this build with all the features that we could possibly need. The reason I've gone B760 rather than Z790 is because we won't be overclocking the CPU here today. And I figured saving $100 on the motherboard could go to better places in this system. I'll be installing into the motherboard a few lovely components. Now let me start with the processor, shall we? This is the Intel Core i5-13400F with a whopping 10 cores and 16 threads, although some are Intel's lower power efficiency oriented cores. This thing's a bit of a beast. There isn't really any other CPU that comes close to the 13400F at this price point. Of course, if you're going for a higher end GPU, I could also recommend the 13600K, but with that, you'll want an overclockable friendly motherboard. For this build though, our Asus motherboard is going to do the job nicely. I'm a massive fan of the aesthetics, but also the connectivity and some of the performance credentials on this board. If you haven't installed a CPU before or even recently, let me show you how. Locate the triangle on the motherboard CPU socket just in the bottom left corner and match it up with the golden triangle on the CPU. Lift up the arm of the socket, then pull the socket cover back and drop the processor very easily into place. Now you want to do this carefully so you don't bend any pins on the motherboard before returning the cover down. Our plasticers have decided it's going to pop off with a mind of its own and adding the arm in to secure it into place. The plastic cover will then be removed at this stage either as it was today or it'll flick off as you actually secure the socket. Once that's done it's time to move on to the RAM or the memory. This is Corsair's Vengeance RGB RT. It's a 32 gigabyte DDR4 kit. Perfect for this system. Obviously, if you've gone for a DDR5 oriented motherboard, you'll want a DDR5 kit of memory. RAM is another one of those components that's actually fairly easy to install in a build like this. I think my key advice for anyone, irrespective of the RAM generation, make sure you've got 32 gigs for a system of this caliber. Pull the notch back, slide the RAM in, a clip on each side, and that will secure it into place. You want to use the second and fourth DIMM slots as a general rule of thumb. That will leave two spare for future upgradability. Up into, I don't know if I want to say this, future proof this build as much as possible. I'm also going to finish things off by installing the SSD. This is the Samsung 980 Pro. Now, historically, this is quite a high-end NVMe drive, but with the release of the 990 Pro, this thing has dropped in price by loads. I am going to install it into the top M.2 slot on the board. It will mean removing the inbuilt heat spreader and not putting it back on, which is a bit of a shame, but I will link the non-heatsink version of the 980 Pro below, which alleviates this problem and might even save you a few quid. Pop that into the slot and keep the cover safe in the motherboard box should you ever want to return it for a different M.2 drive. Next up on the list is the CPU cooler. And you might be thinking, James, do I really want to install this now? Before moving the motherboard into the case? Actually, yes. For a liquid cooler, no. But for an air cooler, it can actually be an easy addition to the build at this early stage. Uh, this is the Deepcool AK400 in white. I've received a bit of heat recently for my recommendations of the 212 line from Cooler Master. And after a quick Google, I kind of saw why the prices seem to have spiraled out of control slightly, making options like this from a lesser known but still reputable brand like Deepcool actually a really, really good shout that's well worth some consideration. Plus, their white products are actually genuinely white. There aren't loads of grey or silver accents. You've got a fully white fan, a fully white heatsink. The, the heat pipes are even sprayed white. Really, really nice. The way that the Deepcool cooler installation works is a bit weird though, so let me guide you through exactly how to do it. 
Now, this is, of course, going to be aimed at those of you uh, with an Intel-oriented system and will also involve consulting the manual. Now, inside of the box, you will find this. Now, this right here is the Intel backplate. This is what we're going to slide through the rear of the motherboard. So take a look on your motherboard, find the four holes and slide the backplate into place. Pop the motherboard back on the motherboard box and that should hold the backplate mostly into place. Inside the box, you'll then find these sort of rib orange stoppery things and some screws. Now bear with me because this is actually going to make a lot of sense quite quickly. You then want to place these orange stopper post sleeve things onto each corner of the back plate. Now they're very loose and that's all to the plan I suppose before taking the included metal bracket and just sitting it on top. You're then going to take the screws in that very same bag and screw through the stopper into the back plate. That's going to actually secure this whole metal square into place, which in itself provides the two threads we need to secure the cooler. Actually a very clever and very simple system. Once the metal plate is on, we can take the cooler, remove the fan just for now. I love, honestly love, love, love how good this looks. Grab the included tube of thermal paste and just drop about a large size grain of rice, if that makes sense, or like two grains of rice. There we go, that'll do us. Not too much, not too little. There's a visual aid to just about the right amount. Then the cooler actually slots into place to line up the two screw threads. You can start them off with your thumbs if you want or go straight in with a screwdriver. Just don't fully tighten one and then the other. Do one for a bit, the other for a bit, the next for a bit. You kind of get the gist. Then the fan goes back on. So that just clips on like so. Look at that. Plenty of clearance too. And then I'm actually going to plug the fan up to one of these headers down here. So the grey one in particular van just slots in a place cable I can tuck away and properly cable manage a bit later on or to be honest you can just stay there once all of this is in I can now go ahead and move the motherboard into the case but first I'm going to take a moment just to admire actually how good that motherboard assembly looks I'm very very pleased with that I'll be installing the motherboard into this obviously the, the case but James what case is it this is the NZXT H5 Elite now NZXT have been on a bit of a roll this year with new cases the H9 that's basically a Leon Leo 11D copy but don't tell anybody the H7 which is uh, a bit bland but the H5 is actually something quite special. Now, it's got a glass front panel. It's got a cool little fan, as you can see on the box here, for blowing air into the GPU. Radiator support. Room for look. Large next-gen graphics cards. Although, of course, we'll be using a smaller, but still relatively large next-gen graphics card in today's build. Handily as well, the side panel here is kind of a tallest design. So we can just pull that off, move this out the way, before removing the rear panel at the back. So let's take off that back panel. Lovely stuff. <coughs> and have a drink because I'm choking. Go. ready to install the motherboard into. Now, there are a couple of things you need to do first. Take the motherboard and actually just find all of the standoff holes. So on this board, we've got three at the top, three down the middle, and three along the bottom. We'll circle those on your screen now. They need to match up with the standoff locations in the motherboard. So if I spin this round, you'll probably be able to see we've got three at the top, three along the middle, and three down the bottom. Now, they all line up. If they didn't line up, or there was a bonus one, or one missing, you want to take it out, add one, remove one, get them all lined up. It's very, very important. Important. Then you can go ahead, slide the motherboard in. Oh yes, lovely stuff. And don't let it drop like that. And just get it to sit over the center standoff, which is actually slightly raised. Before finally going ahead and screwing the board into place. So just pop the screws through into the standoffs and tighten them up one by one. Once the motherboard is in, I can then go ahead and grab the graphics card choice for this system. Now, I've obviously gone for the RTX 4070, the box, and of course the GPU kind of gives it away. But why have I done that? Well, the 4070 is a lot better value than the 4070 Ti, 4080 and 4090 some of which are arguably stupidly overpriced anyway, delivering really amazing 1440p performance with good legs at 4K2. It beats out the 3090, but falls short to the 3090 Ti in most titles is the best way we can explain it. Obviously, some games are an exception to that rule, and some games, this thing will actually beat out the 3090 Ti. You do get access to DLSS 3.0 and all the other RTX 4000 series exclusive features, and according to the leaks and rumors, it doesn't look like AMD are looking to challenge 
change this tier of the market anytime soon. Instead, apparently, they're going to bring out budget cards next, which I'd personally love to see. Back to the 4070, though. Lots of great on-paper specs, plenty of CUDA cores, just about enough memory, I would say, to keep it not... F I don't want to say future-proof, because that's going to bite me in the bum. You know, there's enough VRAM in there to keep you going in the latest AAA titles for at least the next couple of years. No card is perfect, but this certainly fits the bill a lot better than some of the other options. This Founders Edition design is also pretty gorgeous. It's very small compared to, obviously, some of the other larger 40 series options out there. And 4070s are available in the UK, US, Canada. I'm not sure about all the other markets, but in those three markets, at least, at MSRP, in stock, with different coolers you can choose from. Gone are the days of going online and having to just buy whatever cooler they had. Even though you really wanted the Gaming X Trio in white, but you had to get the expensive Asus ROG Strix. Not talking from experience or anything uh, along those lines. Anyway, the graphics card is going to install nice and easily into the motherboard. There are a couple of PCI lane covers already removed in this case from a previous build, but they might not be the right ones. Let's hover the graphics card over the slot and let's see. Aha! So, they are not the right ones. We do need to remove the second slot, but also the third slot. The one I remove can then be moved to the top, creating a nice two PCI lane gap for the GPU to install into. Then I can slide the GPU into place, make sure it's all properly lined up. Don't rush this stage of the build. Aha, uh -huh, there we are. Bit of pressure. Lovely stuff. The graphics card is then going to fasten in nice and easily. Couple of screws. Of course, it does need power, but that will be in the next section of the build. Now, obviously, it would be nice to go for a white card in this system, but the 4070s, a little bit limited so far on what color rays and stuff are available for these GPUs. So all in good time, but once white cards are available, I'd certainly recommend considering one for this system. I'm just trying to figure out frantically how you get this little cover on. I suppose it just sits on there loose, I guess. This kind of this way around just to close off whoops just to close off the gap so let's a couple of screws for a slightly cleaner aesthetic there we are spin that back round looking pretty good to me now with all those components in there's only really one major component left to go and that is of course this the power supply i've opted for the cooler master v750i gold as i wanted an atx3 and pcie gem 5 design now let me show you inside what that actually looks like so of course we have the power supply itself and a nice little cooler master protective bag packaging. Actually, it smells quite nice. Might be the weirdest thing I've ever done on camera, smell a PSG bag. Nice, but probably 120, 140 mil fan in there. Fully modular interface, and of course our next gen 12 volt PCI Gen 5 power connection. Inside of this bag here, you will find all of the cables and stuff that we need, including that slimline PCI 5 power cable, motherboard power, also pretty important. And of course, a What's this one? CPU power cable. Now the elephant in the room is probably gonna be that James, this power supply is black. I thought this was a white-ish themed build. Well, the PSU is gonna be hidden, so that's not so much of an issue. And the cables, I'm actually gonna add custom PSU sleeved cable extensions to anyway. So it doesn't really matter that the power supply doesn't match. The only cable currently we haven't really got an extension for is our PCI Gen 5 unit. But I think, because this cable's so small, we can run it away, tuck it away, and it shouldn't be too much bother. The cable extensions I'll be using are from a company called Easy DIY Fab, who I'll link down below. The build then, looking good, but I think it needs one more thing, a white exhaust fan. Not only for aesthetics, but also, to be honest with you, for the purposes of making sure that, of course, the airflow is pretty good. At the moment, two intake and no active exhaust is going to make our airflow very positive and we do want something to take the heat out of the case. So a couple of screws, for say a couple, I've gone ahead and picked four screws, one on each corner to pop this fan into place and it uses the same RGB controller as the rest of the build. So we can plug this up to the same RGB controller. Front fans use, always a challenge trying to get a fan into place, commentate and film it. There we go, there's one screw. As I say, making things from an RGB control point of view really simple and obviously keeping the cost down because all you've got to do is buy an extra NZXT RGB. GB fan as opposed to a new fan and a new controller. And with that, I think I'm ready to boot this thing up for the first time. Check out performance, but first, see how this thing looks when it's all turned up with the RGB on and the fans feeling what a beautiful prospect in the only way we know how. Roll that montage. If one thing 
thing's for certain, this build looks really good. I'm so happy with how this system turned out. But does the performance also marry up? Well, we've gone ahead and tested the system in a load of the latest titles from Warzone 2 to Fortnite, Apex, and you name it, we've tested it. Warzone 2 is where we're going to start things at 1440p high settings, first of all, with DLSS enabled and set to performance mode. Here the build pulled an impressive 148 FPS, surpassing that all important 144 hertz refresh rate mark that we look to achieve. Obviously, it would have been nice to push even further to 150, 160, but this is very achievable if you tune the resolution down to 1080p. At 1440p, these numbers from a 4070 are really strong. Talking of 1080p gaming, Fortnite is next up, and at 1080p competitive settings, this system pulled in a very, very strong 288 FPS. That is more than enough to satisfy even the most high refresh rate monitors out there. If you've got a 300 or a 360 hertz panel, there's plenty of frame rate to keep that thing moving. Into Apex Legends next, and at 1440p high in this title, frame rates once again hovered around that 150 mark, 158 to be precise. All of the frame rate data was as ever gathered with MSI Afterburners Reaver Tuner and NVIDIA Frame View. Overwatch 2 at 1440p is the next on the list today. Here the build pulled in 235 FPS on average, a pretty easy game to run and admittedly not a very strenuous test of performance. Battlefield 2042 also performed well, 1440p high, with DLSS once again enabled and set to the performance mode, delivered a very impressive 133 frames per second. To round things off, we've got Formula 1 2022 to test out the DLSS 3 and ray tracing power of this build. At the ultra high preset, we will be settings enabled, the system pulled in an amazing 177 FPS on average, showing that Nvidia's frame generation tech, which roughly doubles the available frame rate, really does work in the titles where it is supported. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to drop a like rating, get subscribed, drop a comment with any questions or complaints, maybe hopefully not complaints that you have down below. Thanks for tuning in and as always, we'll see you in the next one.